information we are ready for recording so hello everyone i wanted to say this session will be recorded it's not live streamed so you can prepare freely and feel very comfortable but it is recorded and we will have a look on it uh, for a short and nice cut it session then afterwards so my name is dagmar tucek i'm from austria but with the czech name tucek <laughs> yeah formally uh, i'm running the Austrian Foundation, it's called FREDA, and I'm also board member of the Green European Foundation. I'm very happy uh, to welcome you today for this very interesting and very important session on food again, food security, food crisis in this challenging time of war. So if you please come in and get a little bit crowded in the middle because for the camera, you know, they only see a few people and there are so many of you. So it would be great to have you all in front of us in the middle. Uh, just let me have a short uh, scenery what will happen in the next one and a half hour or say one hour and 20 minutes as we are late. Uh, we will open with a short five or maybe only three minutes networking you in the audience you together just turn around to your neighbor and ask the question or have a little exchange on what has brought you here today and what is something you're hoping to learn more about in this session remember we had a food session yesterday but the focus now will be a little bit a different one and just have in your mind, but take it with you uh, when listening to our inputs then on the uh, pa pa panel here. Uh, we would like to exchange afterwards in the discussion with you two big questions. That is a little bit the goal of this session. I think some of you are politicians or working in a political field and some of you are activists, private persons or work with an NGO. And we would like you to ask to think about what can we ask from or do as politicians or political actors, just to have this exchange then after the discussion. And what can I advocate or do as an activist or NGO member? Just take it with you and we will have it then. Uh, after we had the speeches and the inputs, we will have a very short round where questions within uh, our three uh, speakers uh, will be possible. And then we have prepared something like a hot but still green seed. So if you have questions and if you can give an answer to the questions I just asked, we would appreciate and invite you coming here to take place with us here on one of these seats and have a short discussion with us. So it's like a fishbowl, but for the camera, you know, it can't follow you wherever you see it. So it will be much easier having here with us. So that's it. And I would love to, yeah, have you now the preparation and just talk to your neighbor wherever you're sitting. Thank you so much.
So slowly, slowly, we want to come back. That's great. Thank you so much. And I now want to introduce our speakers for you. And it's a great day today because we had a plenary uh, in the morning, uh, which was women only. And we have a session now that has women only. So I think it's a good signal, as well as Gwendolyn just mentioned earlier, uh, the problems women have in Poland. So I think it's a good sign and a good signal to show such strong women here with me. I introduce to you Paulina Kramer. She's associate professor at the Jagiellonian University in the Institute of Environmental Sciences. Hello and very welcome to you. She will be our first speaker. And then let me introduce to you Jelena. She is with us online. And it's Jelena Borodina, and she is an Ukrainian professor of agriculture and rural development. A hearty welcome to you as well. <laughs> and last but not least, here we are uh, with Harriet Clayton. And Harriet is ad advisor for the Greens in the European Parliament on the Committee on Agriculture and Rural Development. Hearty welcome for you as well. <laughs> and Paulina, let us start with you. And I'm very happy to hear your first input. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, and I will switch to Polish now. And uh, I would like to mention also that I am involved in, and I. Uh, Sorry, I promised to switch to Polish, so I'm a co-creative of, of a collective of scientists and researchers called Research for Nature. Uh, I would like to invite you to visit our websites where we publish a lot of interesting information, including scientific papers on environmental protection and nature in general. And today I would like to give you a short introduction um, to introduce you to the reasons for famine and why shortage of food and hunger can be used as weapon and is weaponized all over the world. In fact, one of the reasons for malnutrition and famine in the world is not the lack of food, actually. A FAO, so the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, says that right now we produce food that would allow us to feed 12 billion people. So there is a huge surplus which unfortunately unfortunately, is consumed by the global north, which is Europe, North America and Australia and China uh, to a bigger and bigger extent. Second reason is that we waste a lot of that food and we are doing it on a gigantic scale. I'm sure that many people will be familiar with that second reason. There is also a third very painful one, which is uh, that we have a, an old overproduction of meat because of excessive uh, animal uh, production. We have too many uh, animals being uh, held for uh, food. Uh, I eat uh, meat uh, myself, but I'm not going to use work such as uh, 
pork or uh, veal, but meat of cows, meat of other, other animals, because we have to realize that even if we do eat meat, we have to be aware of eating a living being. So 80% of all agricultural land in the earth is used for keeping livestock. I'm talking about pastures, industrial pastures, large-scale pastures, and it is also used as fields to grow a feed for animals. And then, ultimately, we have a lot of meat, we have a lot of milk, a lot of dairy, but only uh, it is only able to satisfy 13 percent of our needs of energy from the farm perspective if we um, compare to the amount of land that is spent for animal production and growing feet we if we turned it over and used 80 percent of available land for plant production we would be able to feed 21 billion people so not only are we wasting food we are also wasting wasting land. I'm not going to talk a lot about animal production. It is done basically on an industrial scale. 90% of animal production is done on a large industrial scale. If you are interested in detail, in details, visit websites of pro-animal movements. A significant problem in this phenomenon has something to do uh, with a, um, a lack of alignment between animal production and plant production. Before the war, a majority of the livestock were fed on plants uh, that we cannot eat. Uh, for example, uh, grass uh, or hay for, for cows, uh, hens or chickens, or pigs, some of the most popular species, uh, were fed uh, with uh, uh, some leftovers of uh, human uh, food or other uh, substances uh, other that, that people don't consume. Right now, this is not the case. In Europe, livestock uh, eats uh, feed that is brought from Amazon, uh, from form, from that was grown on land that was former Amazon forest, or uh, fish, actually fish uh, bio. And this fish meal is produced from fish that otherwise could be consumed by people in Africa. So in a way, animal production in Europe is stealing food from Africa. And it, this leads to all the problems uh, to famine and malnutrition. So I think the main reason for malnutrition and famine in the world is the wrong distribution and organization of the food sector. So instead of producing food for the local citizens in South America, they grow feed for livestock in Europe. This same applies to Africa. Instead of allowing people to eat their fish, the fish is uh, processed to make fish meal to feed um, uh, to feed uh, animals. Uh, I don't have much time, but if you are interested, if interested, come to me. I can give you more examples of uh, such wastage. What's also very wrong about the current system, which is very industrialized, is that it produces a lot of uh, greenhouse gases. Uh, and this is caused, on the one hand, by the devastation of the animals, um, Amazon forest, which now emits more CO2 than it captures. Also, for industrial um, um, cow, uh, cow, cow production, uh, a lot of methane, me methane is emitted through the earth. And the worse the quality of food, uh, the, 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 the less grass they eat, the, the more uh, protein, uh, the more methane, and uh, also excrements and urine uh, produced by these animals is also an ecological problem. Also, uh, the nitrogen released uh, from artificial fertilizers, which are used unnecessarily in many places. If you are interested, come and talk to me. I will explain why it is unnecessary in many cases. And what's also happening right now is that hunger and famine is being weaponized as well. Uh, for example, um, 
Putin is trying to make us scared uh, by threatening uh, to cause a famine. Because of supply chains are very long right now in the world, uh, um, African countries uh, are concerned uh, because uh, Putin, is, Putin is threatening that um, the supply of wheat from Ukraine, among others, will be cut. Um, so I don't think we discussed it enough. What is also not being discussed enough and also being used by Putin is the fact that in Russia there are places where they extract uh, raw materials for the production of fertilizers. And although it is unnecessary right now, global agriculture is addicted to fertilizers based on phosphorus, for example. Also in Poland, uh, Russian oligarchs have their shares in plants, in facilities that produce fertilizers. Oh, yeah, it is true that it has been blocked, and but it used to be a huge scandal in the past. Uh, we, can, we should also remember about the history because uh, famine was often weaponized. Uh, uh, we all know about Holodomor, the great famine in Ukraine, which uh, even though Ukraine was very fertile, local people living on this fertile line starved. What's also happening in Yemen, for example, famine is being used and manipulated. We tend to forget about that country, and yet tens of thousands of people hunger st and starve to death, uh, and it is being weaponized as well. Also, Palestine, a place where Israel destroys uh, the local fields. Uh, Erdogan is doing the same, Rjava, which is, it is in the uh, North Serbian Republic right now. Also, what's been happening on the Polish-Belarusian border, refugees uh, being bereft of food because they're prevented access to food. It was also an example of weaponizing food. Without food, we are not able to live, uh, so it is Therefore, it is so easy to weaponize it if you prevent people um, from, from accessing it. It is also often forget, forgotten that in 2020, the World Food uh, Program received a Nobel Prize. And back then, they really appealed uh, to the international community, saying that even though we have an overproduction and a surplus of food in the world, tens of thousands are still starving. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paulina. And I think we obviously can speak about food as a weapon. Thank you for this input very much. And maybe just to remember, many of the fertilizers uh, come originally from chemical weapons to speak about uh, Agent Orange and companies like Monsanto. I think we have to write to tell it here. So before turning to Yelena, I just want to provide you very shortly uh, a few figures. Russia now uh, occupies fifth of agricultural land in the Ukraine that about 22% of the agricultural land since the war, Russian war of aggression against Ukraine began in late February. So the breadbasket of the world is at war. Uh, that comes from the head of the division uh, from the NASA, and they are monitoring the global food production by satellite. The Ukraine supplied nearly half of the world's traded sunflower oil, 9% of wheat, 17% of barley, and 12% of corn before the war. And Russia currently occupies 28% of the country's winter grain fields and 18% of its summer grain or oil seed fields. There, last week or two or three days ago, there had been a little, little light on the horizon. Maybe, Jelena, you can tell us about that something more, that there were some negotiations how the Ukraine can start safely to export grain again. Because now we are waiting for the new harvest, but there's no place anymore to store it. So there had been yeah, just the beginning of maybe... Uh, positive negotiations, how ships 
could leave uh, with grain uh, on board uh, Odessa again. So, Jelena, I invite you to come here to us. You are online. Thank you for your time and sorry that you had been waiting so long a time before we started. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. It is very pleasure to take part in <laughs> Green European Academy. And uh, I say hello from Ukrainian Academician Society from Kyiv. And I would like uh, today make some small speech about how the war in Ukraine could change the global food system. Okay, uh, today everybody is uh, understand it is not the sanctions against the Russia against the Russia Federation caused the, to cause the this part in global food security in the rise uh, in food prices, but the Russia aggression against Ukraine. Today, the global increase in price of wheat, corn, and oil seed has lied over previous price prices caused by higher demand and rising production food under the COVID pandemic. It can be seen that the war halted the process of the global recovery from COVID pandemic, which has been traced in 2021. Meanwhile, Russia's war aggression caused two new, uh, two new destructive factors to food security. First, the war blocked up the markets of agricultural raw resources and final agricultural products. Second, the war significantly affects the markets of primary resources used in agriculture production. Such market shocks cause different reaction and market responses in development country and low income countries. The food situation put in the crisis in insecurity is becoming political process. The increase in food prices has already harmed political process in some uh, low-income countries. The fact, factors of the current global shock in the food market and the rapid increase in prices for agricultural products are impressive but not unpredictable. They become yet another evidence that the global food system backed by industrial and monocultural agriculture needs a radical transformation as it is unstable, sensitive to unpredictable changes and unprepared for current global challenges. In pre-war period, Ukrainian uh, agriculture and Ukrainian agricultural policy was oriented towards industrial agriculture and the growth in monocultural export. The war extremely completed large-scale export-oriented production through splitting logistic chains, ecological disasters, and industrial livestock farmers in according to energy problem, blocking export markets, and center. Amid the war, the domestic food system had shown itself flawed, being Extensive oriented towards the export of agricultural raw materials, given that the nutrition of the own population in the pre war period largely depend on food imports, which was accompanied by a constant increase in prices. The specific weight of food cost in the budget of Ukrainian households before the war reached 50%, and for rural families, 60% and more. Farmers and individuals farming household demonstrate their key role in the preservation and development of local markets and food supply chain in the sole condition of military aggression. Today, being able to quickly change the production structure, they provide the population with fresh vegetables and fruits increased supplies of milk, meat, and eggs to local markets. This is the conclusion of the classic agroeconomical theory regarding the sustainability of small-scale production in confirmed in practice in Ukraine in the period of war. 
The main foundation of their stability is not the economic advantage of small farmers over larger ones, but the important fact that the large farm is run as a capitalist enterprise for the sake of profit and rent, and a small one to ensure the existence of the producers himself. Therefore, small-scale agriculture can exist and develop with much lower income than a large-scale capitalist one. In Ukraine, the war has served losses in the rural areas and also threatened a food crisis inside our country. Russia set the goal to destroy the agriculture economy of Ukraine by targeting all access, fields, agricultural equipment, warehouse, markets, roads, bridges, and ports. In according to conclusion of Ukraine society, Ukraine Academician Society, and considering empirical evidence of the resilience of family-based economic entities in agriculture, the Ukrainian government should guarantee its people the right to the safe food and water by reaching family food self-sufficiency and internal food security during the post-war reconstruction. Today and after the war, it goes to the need to facilitate the access of peasants and all people who want to work in agriculture, to land, to produce, to production resources and to finance. Refusal to increase export with stimulation of short food chain and stable local food markets. Preservation and increase of biodiversity, restoration of healthy soil and agriculture, agriculture agroecological production, joint responsibility of producers and consumption for the production and consumption of high-quality and safe Ukrainian food. Ukrainian Academician Society farmers and farming households to push our Ukrainian government to post the restore Ukraine on the basis of the European environmental strategy, farm to fork, biodiversity and new common agricultural policy of the European Union. This our position corresponded to the intention of Ukrainian regarding future accession to European Union as a full member. Strengthening the role of family farms, developing local food markets and shortening agri-food chain and transition to uh, an ecolog agroecological transformation with the advantage of digital technology in local food production should become the root of the transition to sustainable agri-food systems in Ukraine in the old world. The global food security uh, can uh, provide with uh, small family farmers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jelena. You mentioned many, many points that we will uh, pick up in the discussion later on. Thank you so much for that. But now I turn to Harriet, our third speaker here. Uh, Harriet, the food crisis has been uh, part of the multiple crises we've had to face in the last nearly 10 years by now, starting with the financial crisis and so on and so on, but now has reached a complete new dimension. And I would love to invite you to speak about you as your role as advisor and uh, so more the European, uh, the point of view of the European level uh, and share it with us here on the Great, thank you so much. Good, uh, I hope this is working. Yes, great, okay, hi. Hi everyone, I'm Harriet. I'm very glad to be with you and uh, to get out of my office for a start and to uh, have some more interaction uh, outside of, of my committee. <laughs> so uh, good to see you all. Uh, indeed, um, I thought I would begin with just, let's say some headline reminders about uh, EU agriculture, agricultural policy. Um, of course, the EU is collectively uh, the world's biggest exporter, also the world's biggest importer in this case. Um, 
we have a significant amount of the budget which is dedicated to agricultural policy itself. It's been one third. Um, but at the same time, and I think as uh, our colleague Paulina already adequately highlighted, it is also implicated in a tremendous amount of damage which rebounds on the farmers themselves first and foremost. Pollution to waters, degradation of soil, and so on. Um, uh, and I think in the past a couple of years, we've had to face several crises. Uh, we might think of COVID and the disruption to supply chains, first of all, which is now revealing um, increasing um, inflation, which is uh, global, effectively. And in the re most recent months as well, uh, the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, which ha has um, tremendous consequences, first, firstly for the Ukrainian people, also their, their farmers, their production. So we might think of uh, those three recent um, situations. Uh, a report from several UN bodies this week highlighted that we have this world hunger goal um, to, to put an end to hunger by 2030, and it looks like we will not achieve really this, this goal at looking at the current trajectory. 150 million more people are predicted to be in hunger, which basically leaves us at, at the situation that we set, we were in 2015 when the goal was originally set. So, uh, worrying situation. Um, I note also they had a quote that I thought I would share with you on, uh, from this same report. It, about agricultural uh, policies implication in this. It said that the lion's share of it is targeted to farmers individually through trade and market policies and fiscal subsidies largely tied to production or unconstrained use of variable production inputs. Not only is this much of this support market distorting, but it is not reaching many farmers, um, hurts the environment and does not promote the production of nutritious foods. That's uh, one of the basic things we should consider here today, talking about food security. So we can ask ourselves, uh, what has been the EU reaction within agricultural policy to these combined crises that we have uh, uh, just um, uh, listed? And also, what does that show about its considered place um, in the discussion on food security? So uh, I think uh, there have been clearly some reactions uh, from the EU side to try to support and assist Ukraine. Um, let's note, if we talk about food security, the EU Commission itself was not yet saying that EU own food security was yet impacted, but naturally, looking at the global level, it's a very different picture. Uh, we think of uh, neighbors in uh, Middle East, uh, Northern Africa, I think we already mentioned uh, Ye uh, Yemen, uh, Ethiopia, Egypt, uh, Lebanon, uh, often places that are really reliant on imports and often particularly Ukrainian imports in this case. So this is indeed a problem. And one of the EU reactions was logistical, I would say. They uh, implemented uh, solidarity lanes to try to provide alternate routes for uh, Ukrainian exports. I mean, this is, of course, to try to uh, ensure that food, uh, food security is maintained in other areas of the world at this, in this particular point. But naturally, it is necessary for Ukrainian farmers, their livelihoods, their uh, continued possibility to, to farm. Uh, this is obviously uh, another threat that they face at, at this particular moment. So the first reaction, um, and the first reaction also demanded from uh, in organizations such as World Food uh, Program was support financially and also then support logistically. Um, there has been some positive news uh, on exports recently. They are increasing from Ukraine, so that provides, in this case, some reassurance for, for those parts of the world that rely on it. But uh, some logistical bottlenecks remain, naturally, to, to replace shipping at such short notice is, is very complicated. Uh, the volumes are not the same, and so we see uh, effects on uh, grain staying in, in places like Romania, Poland, which are not necessarily meant to be its final destination, of course. So this, this is a, a complicated issue. Um, EU has taken other reactions to try to um, provide flexibilities in the funds that, for instance, Poland, Romania already have to get EU fund for clothing, for food, also to, to refugees that, that have been uh, displaced and, and welcomed by, by neighboring, neighboring countries particularly. Um, so, uh, if we consider food security, one element of this is inflation in the prices, which has a, a significant uh, effect 
globally, and also this can be seen sometimes in, in low-income countries, also in the EU, low-income um, families, particularly in member states with high levels of inequality. Uh, this, is, this is therefore a, a global concern. Um, the food price index already before uh, the invasion, the war was was very high, uh, and it has it has seen some extra increase. I think another 30% rise on top of that, and it was already at a very high level compared to say 2007A and 2010-11 previous crises. So this is indeed uh, concerning, um, and globally, but also in the EU, in some cases, people do have to choose now. Do they feed themselves? Is it for eating or is it for heating? Is the typical refrain that, it, that, that now becomes a concern. Um, and we might also note, it's also the quality of the diet that's impacted. If we have inflation, uh, which is affecting fruit and vegetables more than staples, then that's going to affect what people are eating as well, the quality of, of their food and their overall diet. So uh, yeah, the reaction in this light of in light of this inflation has been again to provide some support to farmers, but we can sometimes question um, the fact that such support really reveals that we have a certain path dependency in EU agriculture. Uh, they have, for example, uh, allowed flexibilities in state aid and allowed use of the second pillar of the cap, which is normally the rural development part of the cap. They have longer term investments. It's for for jobs for. Rural communities, uh, it's the, let's say the longer term part of the cap that it's not directly going only to farmers. And so it is quite a, a pity that in, in this situation we, uh, we then end up effectively um, following this reflex to, to give greater support to those farmers who have high input costs, who have a uh, big use of feed, uh, fuel, energy. And this in the context where we are trying, and I think we discussed in other panels, to, to reduce um, imports of fossil fuels, um, reduce use overall, of course, but in the geopolitical situation, imports in particular, that is, is, is um, frustrating that this long-term part of the cap is now having to be used in, in such a way which effectively can result sometimes in a sort of subsidy effect for precisely what we do not want to, to continue subsidizing. Um, I think another element that COVID especially revealed um, in, in food security is that uh, it's not only what we import that can make us vulnerable, but also what you export. Uh, I remember at the beginning of COVID, we had long discussions about the wine sector. And of course, if we are, we are discussing food security, of course, wine is a beautiful cultural good, it, it is historic, it is very important food that we would not neither want to lose, but it is not, I would say, the primordial uh, interest when we discuss food security. So I think this is quite notable that it reminds us that uh, once we once we start to ex ex use so much expenditure in this direction, uh, we are in a way constrained and it, it becomes more and more difficult to, to um, get out of this and to direct um, money for agricultural policy towards production of more nutritious uh, and that food which is really needed. So, um, and yeah, before I finish on the COVID point as well, food security also will necessarily rely on having healthy, safe, well remunerated jobs in the agricultural sector. Um, perhaps you remember there was also stories in the US, in Europe, about problems in slaughterhouses with the people working in, in very difficult conditions that in COVID times very rapidly became unsanitary. So we have uh, migrant labor, seasonal labor that, that should be assured good conditions and, uh, diff and currently we see situations of, of practically exploitation sometimes, so this is quite a concern. So here, I mean, in the three, uh, the three crises that we, we can uh, focus on here, we see that there is indeed a, a link. It seems to be um, those sectors that rely on really long supply chains that are more concentrated. If we might borrow some banking crisis analogy, they are sort of seen as too big to fail. And they are the first ones, ironically, that, that can suffer from the high input use in terms of fuel, electricity, uh, feed. Um, so really, we, we now have to, to question and question our responses and what this tells us about the, the real long-term shift we need in, in um, agricultural policy. 
to, to, to remove ourselves from this reliance. Um, and of course, in, in the background of all this, we have the climate change crisis and the biodiversity crisis. Uh, this is uh, climate change we see is already affecting us. Last year it's floods, this year it's heat waves. Uh, it's going to be a combination of both every year, I feel. Um, it, it, it becomes more and more evident, and farmers indeed are often the ones that feel it the most viscerally on their, in their everyday life. So, um, uh, but, uh, and so here we have really now a conjunction of crises that should tell us logically the now is the time to continue with european goals set in for example a farm to fork uh, to reduce input use this would be both financially helpful for the farmers reduce the amount of environmental damage and therefore maintain their business and our collective food security in the longer term but um, there have been certain reactions uh, within the present agricultural policy and the new uh, CAP uh, strategic plans that start next year, which have been quite worryingly um, counterproductive uh, from, from this point of view. Uh, I wonder, before I get too nerdy, does anyone know what GAIX are? I am sorry, I don't know if, yes, I see some hands, okay, great. <laughs> I don't know the Polish acronym, so uh, good luck for the interpreters to <laughs> understand that. But actually what it is, is good agricultural and environmental conditions. And this is what, what farmers, many of the best, do it as a natural matter of course. Um, but these are the conditions under which uh, you have to work if you, if you want to also access agricultural subsidies. And here, in order to um, react to these crises, some of the impulses have been to try to scramble to push production at, at any cost. And I think as uh, both Paulina and Olena have already mentioned, uh, production itself uh, is, is not really the problem at this stage, it's, it's, it's more the distribution. So, um, and taking into account that climate change and biodiversity are big long-term threats that we must maintain uh, in mind. This is uh, a worryingly counterproductive. So for example, there's a, a, a condition on, on crop rotation. And we might think that right now, um, this should be the good thing that we should at least maintain as a baseline of conditions that farmers should um, undertake. It, it's good for the soil, it's an age-old practice, um, it's in light of high fertilizer prices and even projected next year difficulties in sourcing the fertilizer on top of that, it, it seems only logical that now is really the time to make sure that farmers have received the advice, received the support, uh, have a more developed like, protein plan that can really help them to integrate, for example, leguminous crops into their rotation. That helps us to stop relying on imports, long supply chains that end up with deforestation in Brazil in many cases. Um, it increases self-sufficiency and it will be beneficial for, for the soil in, in this sense. Um, and also we might think of the space that we provide for nature. This has also been um, put into question at this point, despite the fact that three quarters of the most important crops in, uh, globally rely on pollinators, at least to some extent. I think the IPBS uh, report on pollinators from 2016 said about five to 8% is, is completely reliant on pollinators. So if we're talking n quite nearly 10% of the food production, this is a long-term threat that we need to, to maintain in mind and to um, to ensure that the most basic agricultural practices are not are not um, furthering this this problem and kicking the can further down the road when we'll have an even worse situation so here are, are some uh, concerning uh, adjustments uh, to, that have been made for this year and some even trying to prolong this into next year um, which would be very counterproductive for, for the longer term of food security. Um, we see here then that it's, it's not giving our farmers really a good directioning neither. In previous panels on, on other topics, we saw the need for a, a just transition in other sectors. And I think quite similarly, we need the same thing in, in agriculture, um, a, a managed uh, transition to reduce use of, of inputs, to re really focus our public procurement, um, promotional policies to what is going to provide healthy food um, for 
those in the EU and the close neighborhood, and also ensuring that our trade policies do not interfere with the rights of others to also do the same, to produce uh, local nutritious food. Um, I think I will just uh, finish at this point. I feel maybe I'm up to 10 minutes. Um, yes, and also another thing that we should consider from the EU level, which has been treated a little bit inconsistently, I have to say, is the problem of speculation. Um, Naturally, I mean, supply and demand will affect food, but here we see on top of that there have been um, increasing financial activity regarding agricultural commodities. And this is something where really uh, the EU can also um, have a stricter stance. Uh, in fact, in the most recent plenary, I think we had a rather contradictory situation. We had a report actually on food security. It wasn't from agriculture, but I think the development committee in this case were taking the lead. And there they were saying we need to have stricter position limits um, to curtail uh, speculation on what is at the end of the day a huge factor in the consumption baskets of those on very low incomes, both in EU but globally, um, that really affects their access to food. Um, at the same time, we had a concrete objection to a delegated act that might have permitted us to precisely do so, and this was, was not followed through with. So here we see sometimes a little bit of contradiction between the, the, the full awareness of, of uh, actions that we should be taking, um, also for the, the long term of food security. Um, that, that needs to see more, more pressure to really follow through and to be consistent in our policies, I think. So, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Harriet, and thank you for the big dedication to the topic. That was great to listen to you, and you mentioned so many, 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 many important points. It's uh, all about food, of course, but it's all about climate, about biodiversity, about economy, uh, and yeah, how we can uh, react on this point as a community, as a global community, but as well as a very small community uh, in your village, in your family, and so on and so on. So now it should be uh, the time for a short round in between our speakers. So if you have any questions and remarks on each other, I would love to hear them and let us have 10 minutes for exchange here uh, in between you. Who wants to start? Jelena, maybe you. Are there some uh, questions on your colleagues or remark on that what you already heard by now? Yes, uh, it's very interesting to uh, look at this uh, opinion of my colleagues and I agree with this sentence. And uh, in according to Ukraine problem, uh, we suppose uh, the problem with the export of Ukrainian seeds. It's a short-term problem and uh, it will be solved in next future in few months. And uh, in, now Ukraine has a more strategic problem, the problem uh, post-war uh, reconstruction of Ukrainian uh, economic, and we would like to change our um, model of agricultural development, which we have in previous time, because this model uh, uh, based on the neoliberal uh, uh, approach to the agricultural development. And with this model, we have uh, good results in uh, exports and uh, in global food security, but we have a lot of problem internal in our country. We have uh, um, damage of rural uh, settlements, and we have damage of uh, rural uh, territory, and we have a big, big problem with uh, small-scale producers in, in Ukraine. So we would like to reconstructive, uh, reconstruction our uh, economic agricultural uh, in way, which we have in uh, European Union and uh, is in country which uh, uh, care of, of ecological problem and uh, uh, well-being of rural population. Thank you. Thank you, Jelena, for this very important point. Uh, yeah. 
reconstruction, not only of economy and basements and so on, but also of agricultural area of decommun uh, de how to say it in English, uh, decommun yeah, uh, if there are, the soil is a de I mean, I'm losing the word. Maybe someone helps me. Decontamination? <laughs> yes, that was it. Thank you so much. So this will uh, force uh, a lot of cooperation within the uh, European Union uh, to help here and uh, to carry on and, and uh, come back to our more decent uh, possibilities of production again. So I will turn to Paulina now, you uh, also do a lot of work on animal welfare uh, and uh, we had the topic that uh, how much do you still need animal production and how strong it is combined with the climate question. But we had a short uh, talk yesterday uh, during the food session yesterday that we still need the animal production. And I would just invite you to give some hints again today because I think that was such an important thing. If we speak about fertilizers, uh, chemical fertilizers, we have also to speak about uh, animals uh, as helpers in the agriculture, so please. Uh, so uh, we need animals because, uh, yeah, so uh, nowadays still in Europe and it's kind of, I, I can say that this uh, common agricultural politic is not brave enough because uh, uh, still the biggest, the, the biggest farmers as well with animals uh, are the most subsidized. It's, I think, one of the biggest problems. And now we, we see in the Netherlands what is going on. So firstly, they kind of uh, convince, force uh, farmers to culture more animals, breed more animals. And now they expect that suddenly they kind of stop keeping so, any, so many animals. And uh, the problem is, of course, as I said yesterday, uh, always the price, yeah? So if they would have better price for the, the, the products like a meat, milk, and so on. So they wouldn't need to keep so many animals, yeah. So it would be the question not to limit the uh, number of uh, farms, as they expect now to do, but the numbers of animals, yes. And uh, then we, we can switch to more, uh, to better uh, uh, way of uh, breeding animals not like in, in these industrial uh, uh, farms. Uh, so to, to uh, sure that they, yeah, that they can realize their biological function and so on. Yes, and at the same time, uh, if they are kept in good conditions, they can be also sourced, let's say, I, I know that it sounds not very, maybe not nice, like a production from animals, but anyway. So they can be also source of, of the best kind of fertilizers, the, uh, the natural fertilizers. And there are many, many studies showing that this, this kind of uh, fertilizers are really the best for the, for the soil. And uh, in fact, in ecosystem and also in the agricultural ecosystem, the soil is the most important part, yes? Because the, the, the good quality of soil, I think it's uh, well visible in Ukraine with this, uh, because in Ukraine you, you can find the best kind of soils. And these soils were produced in the past by animals, yes? grazing on the meadows and so on. And it's the same case, for example, was in the States and in many, many countries uh, where, where the soil was just produced by grazing animals. So uh, it's not only uh, their feces, but also the way are, they are going through the, uh, through the meadows. Uh, so, uh, and with these natural fertilizers, we can repla replace uh, completely uh, this uh, artificial fertilizers. Uh, because another point with these artificial fertilizers is that they are kind of toxic to many uh, microorganisms, including uh, uh, mycorrhizal fungi, yeah? so, which are really crucial for functioning of the soil. And also they are crucial for good crop, yeah? And again, there are many studies showing that uh, if you use kind of, a, even uh, called it ecological intensification, what includes also the natural fertilizers, you can really uh, can have a 
bigger crop yeah so what is uh, yeah so it's yeah so it's uh, also very important that this uh, ecological intensification it's uh, for kind of future uh, uh, food security is really better than than this industrialization and chemical intensification so yes of course we have to limit the number of animals but yeah we, we, we have to cooperate with them somehow, so take care about them and they will not only provide us with, uh, no, let's say proteins, but also with uh, fertilizers for our, uh, our soils. So thank you very much, Paulina, for that. That means uh, cooperation not only between us as human beings, uh, between countries, but also between the species, uh, with the animals, with the plants. It only will work like this, of course. So I come back to you once more, Harriet, um, because you, uh, uh, one of your last topics uh, in the input has been the speculation on food and food commodities. I will come back to that. Uh, there. We, many, many work, years as foundations work on the topic, uh, how much regional can you be in food production and how much global it has to be. So there are countries that need to export. Uh, they can't do it without agricultural uh, export to survive. So how to combine this and how uh, is the perspective of the EU uh, having a, a limit to this possibility of speculations and yeah. Yeah, I think this is um, one, one delicate issue perhaps. I mean, in terms of, of supply chains, we see vulnerabilities in very long supply chains. They are hit uh, also in COVID by disruption in freight, uh, inflation. Um, so this, we see evident vulnerabilities. At the same time, I mean, it. It's true, if you have a local shock, you need some support from the outside. So I think it, it's really a matter of, of, of balance, of course, of getting stronger supply chains. Doesn't mean that every supply chain is, is ever going to be super short and local perhaps, but, but the focus, the concentration should be there in order to, to get some more um, resilience when, when global uh, shocks can happen. Um, and I think uh, this also is, is interesting in terms of um, food security for uh, those that import a lot, but also those that export a lot. And, and of course, I mean, we, they are linked. Often uh, you're exporting a lot, uh, why? In order to get the foreign currency reserve that you can then use to import what you actually need in terms of nutrition and healthy diets and so on. So here we do see, um, Something that is very complicated, perhaps um, in um, locked in a pathway that that is very difficult to to get out of. Um, I think that's why it, it's important then that uh, from the EU side, our policies in terms of agriculture, in terms of trade, and also development should be coherent, um, in order that, for example, our development can share best practices, support local production of food, and have it not be overrun later by by the results of, of our subsidies gone wrong, uh, subsidies in, in the wrong sector, which we do not ourselves need for, for nutritious feed. So uh, I think this is also um, a complex situation uh, that that needs to needs to be addressed in, in a coherent manner. Thank you very much, Harriet. So um, the floor is open now for our audience, and uh, we have a big range of topics here. Uh, I already saw you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, we have a big range of topics here, and I just want to remind you on the question that we put at the beginning, what can we do as individuals, as people working for an NGO? What can we ask politics to do, and what can we do as politicians if there are some people in the audience that uh, work on that field as well? Uh, for example, just the just a, f a very little example from Austria, where I am from, uh, there now is a big, big trend because Austria is not a poor country, but we have many uh, people that now can not afford, uh, as you say, they have to decide, will it be warm in winter in my flat or have I enough to eat and to provide my children? So this is really a big topic. Uh, you can't imagine, but it is like that. And many of us now turn to have a very small but uh, effective uh, 
self-supply of vegetables. Uh, we do it on balconies. We also can put it out of the window with some, yeah, uh, uh, help to do it, and it grows on the facades of uh, in the houses and in provided urban gardening places. And also now the trend is to provide those uh, possibilities on roofs. And this is effective and it works. You have maybe to learn a little bit how to do it uh, and won't be <laughs> the best result in your first try, but in the second try as well, it will work. So we have very small possibilities and we have, uh, yeah, we have the need to have a big and global uh, cooperation on that. And I will invite you to our chair and Tommy, he is very brave. He was the first one just come out to us. Thank you so much. Just take the microphone. It will work. It's around here. Yeah, great. Thanks. Hello. Uh, my name is Tommy Simpson from Ireland. Uh, I'm with the Green Foundation Ireland, which is affiliated to the Green European Foundation. Uh, and with the help of the Green European Foundation, we have produced uh, two documents on this topic. Uh, one of them is called A Question of Scale, and the other one is called uh, Food Sovereignty and Local Resilience. So uh, they, 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 if you want copies, they're also on the... the, in, the the, the, the website. So, uh, but w one of the questions, when we were addressing this issue of a question of scale, we were looking at how can we scale things down to the local level as much as possible. And this, some of this happened as a result of COVID, uh, the situation. But um, what we were trying to address too was the situation in Ireland of the whole marketing policies and exports uh, and the increase in the cattle herd, uh, as been said, uh, sometimes there's too many cattle. We, our dairy herd has gone up uh, from, nine, from 2015 by 50%. 50% because when they abolished the quota on milk quotas, the, uh, the farmers could produce as much milk as possible. So for a small country, we're producing 8.5 billion litres of milk per annum. And we, are, we have the six biggest corporations producing baby milk formula, exporting all over the world. 15% of all baby milk formula in China is Irish baby milk formula. And 15%. And, and the, the result of that, the marketing, when we ask about the marketing ethics of this, the farmers and their representatives say, oh, we only produce, we're not concerned about the ethics. Now, the ethics are come into play on, uh, in this example of what they, what they call comparative advantage in marketing terms is about or we can make it cheaper, so you know. So we sell. We can send it halfway around the world and make it cheaper. And this 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 term is a, is a, you know it's not a very green way. They don't count the carbon footprint uh, in this. But just to give one example uh, on on baby milk formula in China, it's a it's a big issue. Uh, the figures I have there's something like uh, was it. 30, uh, the, the mothers in China, the, the percentage using breast milk, breastfed babies has gone down from 60% to 30%, a drop in China alone. And the World Health Organization figures are that the 800,000 babies a year die because of the practices of baby milk farms. 20,000 mothers die every year because of the practices in this uh, marketing of baby milk formula, which is supposed to be six months after. But uh, so we, we question the ethics of all this. And not only that, the side effects of the production system means that all our rivers in Ireland are polluted with nitrogen because Ireland has a nitrogen der uh, derogation from Europe of, uh, since 1991. And so the rivers are nearly all polluted. And that's only one side effect. There are many, many other side effects. So this idea of monoculture producing the one product uh, to export because of comparative advantage is something we as Greens have to get away from. And, and of course, we are doing it. We're but but uh, the effects of the large corporations uh, like uh, Wyatt, the six giant corporations, Nestle, all of these companies are 
marketing unethically, and I would even say criminally, uh, to, 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 to this effect. So we, we've got to get away from this and look at the local production for local needs as much as possible. No, it's not uh, possible everywhere, but uh, the, 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 what I would just say, the example of what happened in Great Britain during the war, where every piece of land was taken into use, even grass verges on streets for food production. We need to get back and have the, what happened during the COVID situation, where we accepted top-down approaches from government because of the emergency. We need to declare a food emergency as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom, sharing this very important focus with us. So, who is going to be next? Uh, first was the lady behind, yeah, in the second row. So, please come. And I saw you, I saw you too. Wherever you are. Hi, this is working right. <laughs> I'm Paz, I'm from Spain, I'm from Ecopolitica, which is a publication partnered with the Green European Journal. And, well, we were talking about many things, many important things. Spain also has a big agricultural sector, and we suffer from some of the impacts that Harriet was outlining. And one of the keys, I would say, would be diversification of the agricultural Systems, but then, I mean, both in crops and cattle, but then would be, we would be less dependent on imports, and of course, that's a goal as Greens, but when we look at the bigger picture, and especially here with uh, uh, Yelena from Ukraine, I, I'm always thinking about what will happen in the in balance between countries if we alone take on this uh, much needed transition in our ag agricultural system, but we cannot let or leave other countries alone to, to then deal with their transformations as if it were not our responsibility anymore. And then um, one thing I am always concerned about is industrial or factory farming. Uh, so you were talking about the need to limit the number of animals. In Spain, we now have more pigs than inhabitants, uh, which can... 70% kept in the industrial farms, yeah. Yeah, so, and it, it, it is destroying our rural environment. It, it uh, like... It is moving people away from the rural areas, and of course, um, yes, everyone in, in, in urban areas should be thinking about how to be uh, like pro producing food, but then it is, there is also a disconnection between the urban and the rural part of countries, and we in Spain don't see what's happening in, in rural areas and don't see the pollution that the, our agricultural system is causing and the damage it is causing. And now we are talking about jobs and about uh, the need for money. And I also work at a consumer organization and another issue is the prices and the access to affordable, healthy food. We are seeing more and more a divide in Spain between people who can afford to eat healthy food, not only like not only vegetables but healthy vegetables, and the people who cannot do that. And there's been like a push for reducing prices by um, banning all VAT and uh, taxes on food production, but. Then, I mean, we, we need to always think of a bigger picture because then it also reduces the capacity of countries to transform the, their system. So, yeah, that's, I don't have any answers. I just have these questions, but I, like, I felt it was important to be thinking about how to do this in a just way. So, just transition also in the agricultural 
uh, aspect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think you have been next and then you. Great. Just come up. Thank you. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, so, uh, Professor already mentioned the protests in uh, the Netherlands, but if I could ask you for comments about this situation there. And my other question concerns uh, uh, what, what was mentioned also by the gentleman from Ireland, the huge corporations which um, dominate uh, farming and technology. Uh, if we are to we are starting this transition to these green technologies, but I think we face this huge threat that we will have exactly the same corporations, but they will use green technologies and also uh, GMOs and gen editing and. These phenomena like Nestle, which was mentioned, like trying to privatize water and uh, things like this. So my question is, how huge to your mind is this threat, if you agree with my diagnosis of this uh, threat? Thank you. Uh, thank you for this question. Uh, as we only have 10 minutes left, I would ask you to answer on this question in the last round in our wrap up, just keep them in mind. And I have you and then you, and then we will close for our last round. Please come here. Mm, yes. Uh, so I have a couple of uh, comments just to bring your attention, maybe re re repeat uh, uh, some stuff. I'm Anna. Uh, I'm from Ukraine, from the NGO uh, Eco Action, uh, and I uh, also work with, with the uh, agriculture and environmental issues. Uh, yesterday, also had a, a, an honor, an honor uh, uh, to be a speaker in one of the panels. Um, and like since yesterday, uh, like one not a quote, but the uh, idea of uh, like one philosopher and a political thinker. Uh, 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 that I recalled from my students' years, uh, Amartya Sen, I believe also a, a Nobel Prize winner. Uh, he had a, I mean, as a student, uh, I was just in love with his book, Development as Freedom. Uh, and there was a one, uh, back then, fascinating for me, uh, thought that never in a, uh, humankind history, there was never a, a famine or hunger uh, in a democratic societies. It's always in a totalitarian. Uh, and, uh, yeah. We now again now see, see, see this example when a totalitarian wicked regime is posing uh, or threatening uh, the whole world uh, uh, either with the hunger or uh, with the shortage uh, of the food. Uh, so from this perspective, I mean, it's super important uh, uh, to remain and support uh, young democracies because uh, we are dependent. Um, yeah, dependent, uh, or we are as strong uh, and as resilient as our partners and neighbors are. Uh, so supporting young democracies uh, as Ukraine is uh, is crucial, actually, for, for the food security. Um, and that's another thought that one of the uh, participants here uh, yesterday mentioned when we had this uh, uh, range here from how uh, positive we are uh, about the Europe, and the uh, uh, last speaker told that, yeah, or my interpretation again, uh, that yes, here uh, in Europe or in the EU, it's far from perfect, but that's the right place to make a change. And that was like really, mm, uh, yeah, bringing uh, hope for everyone. Uh, that's one thing. And, uh, uh, others about I also want to say about the uh, fertilizers and this uh, um, you know, we know about the environmental consequences and we are really need uh, uh, better nutrients management and uh, greener uh, alternatives Highland because it was uh, um, yeah uh, 
it was surprising for me that the, this uh, artificial fertilizer, they uh, very much linked to the gas production. Uh, and uh, again, uh, Russia and Belarus is basically monopolist on the global market with the fertilizers. So it's not only about environment, it's also, uh, again, about the uh, being dependent on, on uh, totalitarian regimes. Uh, it's not only about environment, it's about the uh, politics and our security at large. Uh, and, uh, uh, yeah, uh, about uh, Ukraine, a uh, few last uh, uh, notes uh, about the land. Uh, it was mentioned that uh, almost like one quarter or one third uh, of the land, agricultural land, is now uh, under uh, occupation or under uh, heavy uh, attacks. Um, and that land uh, well, most probably won't be... Um, Mm, won't be used for the agricultural needs, not only after the war will be ended, but because of the, all the mines uh, and all the pollution, it will take uh, uh, decades, if not centuries, uh, um, to be able to grow the food uh, again there. Uh, so you can imagine 30% of the most fertile soil is uh, basically uh, gone for us. Uh, so the consequences of this war we will still face, or the region will still uh, face for many, many years to come. Uh, and one last thing um, about uh, like what can be done on a political level, because uh, as a Ukrainian, uh, and I know that our decision makers also look for, for the EU, Europe, uh, for your example, uh, like we are really, like, we want to be uh, part uh, of the EU family, and we're also looking for uh, your trends. Uh, well, uh, just uh, one th uh, important thing uh, for the Europeans or uh, EU uh, politicians, and not only politicians, for the, the civil society and to everyone, to just uh, uh, yeah look uh, and suggest carefully what to support in Ukraine, what model of agriculture. Because uh, already now there are lots of talks and plans uh, about the uh, sector, I mean Ukraine uh, in general and the agriculture uh, reconstruction or post-war recovery. So really, yeah, just be careful and, uh, you know, don't hesitate to uh, uh, advise and, and suggest what kind of uh, production. Is it, again, industrial or uh, uh, agroecological mo uh, models that will be supported in Ukraine with, uh, with your help? Yeah, that's the uh, last note for me. Thank you. Thank you. I think that was great. So decently, our last speaker from the audience said it's okay for her if we close here now on the panel. And I would love to give you the floor once more for a little wrap up. Uh, the question for today was also to find some possible ways out. And we know each way out has so many, many obstacles uh, we have to get over, but I think we have to be somehow positive and to have a clear focus on what we can do and what we want to do and where our heart goes to do it. So just take with you the questions that you had uh, from the audience. I think you have two questions to answer. Put it in your last wrap up and go ahead. Thank you. I remember only one about this company, so of course I agree. And my favorite uh, writer, philosopher of food, Caroline Steele, used to say that uh, who, is go who is ruling the food is ruling the world. And it's going, yeah, it's happening now, for example, if, in case of Nestle. And uh, we have to remember that the price are not uh, uh, increased by farmers, but like companies and so on, yeah. And uh, what we can do, as, as, as you used to say, we have to talk with each other especially with farmers. Uh, we have to discuss and uh, yeah, just to be on very side and not like in sometimes it's in Poland in opposite because really otherwise we will be completely lost yeah, with all these companies. So please talk with, with, with each other and discuss and not uh, yeah, quarrel. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. May I pass over to you, Jelena, please? your last remark for today, please. Mm -hmm. 
I'm very happy to be here, and I suppose uh, my colleagues Anya Daniliak uh, clarify some very important points about Ukraine, and uh, we would like uh, uh, to be more uh, closely to European Union, and uh, we suppose uh, we will together change uh, the situation in Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you. And Harriet, a short wrap-up from you. Yes, I think a uh, very important uh, also intervention from from uh, last colleague saying um, what, what kind of future uh, can we envision also for Ukrainian agriculture? And of course, every country uh, is, is doing that on its, on its own as well. Um, I think something that came up in the panel yesterday as well is, again, to recall that, yes, uh, it's most of the calories coming from not global supply chains, but from more locally. Uh, I think it's, it's a minority, really, that are internationally traded. So and I think now we have, of course, major focus on Ukraine in terms of export, what they can provide to those, those countries that are really reliant on them. Um, but of course, this is not the whole picture. And I think um, from the EU side, having such a strong budget, um, Nevertheless, we need to remember the the strong uh, foundations of the EU agriculture that we that is there basically to provide nutritious food and um, healthy and profitable conditions for farmers to to work in to provide that. Uh, I think this is really something that that is also a reassuring uh, baseline to work with. We have funds, we just need to put them in, in the right direction. Um, and also, yeah, I think our, our Irish colleague uh, highlighted that often it, it will be also farmers themselves that are in the end suffering from the environmental damage that they see. And I'm sure that if we can work together, this this is also a common goal, an opportunity um, that, that we all need to to work in this shift. Thanks. Thank you, Harriet. Uh, and I just want to add something because you said, and that was very interesting, that famine never has been in democratic uh, surroundings. So maybe we, uh, if you look at the history of mankind, there we have tyranny, oppression, but very rare uh, efficient democratic systems in our history. So <laughs> war and oppression seem to be the big wound of mankind and uh, we have to get over it. Speaking about just transition, it's also a transition in of uh, your mind, of your thinking, of your patterns uh, that don't work anymore and have no right to be here in this century or, yeah, let's say like this. And I want to close with Spike Lee. You may remember his great film, it was 1989, Do the Right Thing, and not talking about these wrong patterns. Uh, just try to survive anyway. It makes it even worse. We have to talk together and we have to transform ourselves as well. So as he says, uh, Doing the right thing is good, but don't do the wrong thing is just a good start. And I hope you will take this with us and with you home and have a good focus and think a little bit positiver and try to help for, yeah, assist to this just transition. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much. So do the right thing or at least don't do wrong things. Uh, food security in times of crisis. Thank you very much for this panel and the intense discussion. You're in a way lucky because you can stay here right now with our uh, next 40 minute session and then you will be having lunch. We will be waiting like for two more minutes that the other streams can join us, the participants of the other streams. Um, and then we would start with our next session. But don't run away, stay here. It's worth it, I promise you.